Thank you for downloading this podcast from The Reedy Clubby Show on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. For more, please go to 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Oh, Chris, so lovely to speak to you. Did you travel safely? Uh, well, up to a point, Reedy, because South African Airways saw fit to send me home, but they thought my luggage needed to spend a bit more time in South Africa. Everyone oh. should spend a bit more time in South Africa, but when you've got a conference to go to and you're going to go there without any of your bags, it's a little bit inconvenient. Oh, Hopefully no. Hopefully they'll turn at some point. Now, I never had this happen before, actually. It's a bit of a shame, but... Um, yeah, oh, so I'm, I'm in the same pair of clothes I've had on for a day or so now, and uh, you know, I'm getting quite so a good the, beard. So the luggage hasn't arrived. <laughs> hasn't arrived. Uh, luggage yet. didn't turn up, no. and um, apparently it spent some time in Cape Town. But hopefully we'll be here today. Fingers crossed. Oh no, Chris, that's absolutely terrible. <laughs> but please let us know if there's anything we can do. Maybe follow up with somebody. I don't know if you have a reference number. If there's someone we can call from here just to speed things up. Uh, well, uh, that would be nice because <laughs> they weren't terribly concerned about it when I got to Heathrow and I stood there for an hour or so and there's taxis running up a very big bill outside in the street while, while this luggage doesn't appear. And then they sort of said, well, you know, we'll find it and hopefully send it to you. Like, Great. Thanks for that. No, that's absolutely unacceptable. I mean, we have no control over what they do, but certainly we can put the spotlight, call someone, send the reference number, and just make a bit of noise uh, about it. I'm sorry that you've experienced that. And if anyone has experienced it, you would know how uncomfortable it is. And Chris, I always, always, always uh, get so so cross that it, it, it happens when you're traveling a, a great distance, not when you're traveling from Joburg to Cape Town. It happened to me when I was traveling from South Africa to Indonesia, and my luggage arrived the day that I was returning home. So what's the point? Oh, no. You know, Ah, no, that was, and you know how small those women are. So to go and (laughs) shop, I couldn't find. (laughs) <laughs> I couldn't find oh, my size. No. I'm sorry about that, Chris, but uh, we'll speak off air no and see what we can do. Okay, so yeah. cochlear implants um, have restored hearing uh, to many deaf people. In fact, we had a caller uh, yesterday who talked about his son who is deaf and some of the research and, and, and investigations that they are doing. There's some new developments here, Chris? Well, there's a really interesting paper that's come out showing that you can use a cochlear implant to do gene therapy in the ear and improve the sensitivity of the ear to the cochlear implant itself and therefore improve hearing. Now, this is the work of Gary Housley, who's a researcher at the University of New South Wales in Australia, and the paper's in Science Translational Medicine this week. And they've done this work in guinea pigs because there is a guinea pig equivalent of a cochlear implant that can be used for test purposes. And what they've shown is that if you make a small piece of DNA which has a gene in it, which is a growth factor for nerve cells. That gene is called BDNF, a brain-derived neurotrophic factor. If you inject that into the inner ear and then thread in the cochlear implant, you can stimulate, by generating an electric current with the cochlear implant, the cells along the cochlea, which is the organ of hearing. This encourages the cells to become much more permeable to the short piece of DNA you've put in. They take it up and they then begin to make that growth factor which they then secrete locally, and nerve cells in the cochlea, whose job it is to to send the information about the sounds that are being picked up to the brain, those nerve cells put out far more connections and what we call neurites, little extensions of the nerve endings, which makes them much more sensitive to the signals that are normally produced by the cochlear implant. And what the researchers are saying is that it might be possible to produce even smaller higher resolution cochlear implants with far more electrodes because you could put in far less electricity to stimulate these much more sensitive nerves. And this means that the quality of the hearing experience for people with a cochlear implant would be dramatically better. And in their guinea pig experiments, that's exactly what they show, that the threshold for hearing in their test guinea pigs is at least 50% better than the animals that haven't had this particular intervention. So it's really important. Chris, are you still with us? Yes, indeed. Yeah, I was, okay, I, okay. I, we keep losing you. We finish. keep losing you at some yeah, point. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. And uh, you've told us about what this uh, new research uh, is significant and why uh, deaf people, the deaf community, needs to be excited about it, I suppose. But you've got something else on coral reefs. Yes, that's right, really. So one of the other big concerns in the last decade has been that people have shown that as the temperature of the ocean rises, that corals 
don't take kindly to this, and they undergo a process called bleaching. And this is where, for some reason, the corals get stressed and they eject these photosynthetic algae, the tiny organisms that capture sunlight and then feed the energy from the sunlight as a form of chemical food into the coral. The corals get too hot and they chuck out the algae and then they bleach and this can kill the coral. And so one of the big concerns is with climate change and ocean temperatures rising, can corals keep up? Can corals adapt fast enough? There's a paper in Science this week by Stephen Palumbi. He's at Stanford University. And they've done a very interesting experiment in the U.S. National Park of American Samoa. There's a place called Ofu Island. And just because of the way the island's arranged, there are some pools of water which are left behind when the tide falls. And some of these pools get very, very hot during the day when the sunlight shines on them. They get to, say, 35 degrees, which is way beyond the temperature at which corals would normally bleach at. So this has given them an opportunity to study corals which are in these pools and corals which are closer to the sea, which don't have the same temperature departure. And they've done a very interesting experiment where they take a bit of coral from one of the pools and transplant it to the other and see if the coral can survive or tolerate it. And if it does, what does it do genetically to make that switch? And they were looking at a particular type of coral called Acropora hyacinthus. And this is a tabletop coral. It forms reefs all over the Pacific Ocean. So it's very common, very important coral. And they found that actually the corals can survive this transplantation. And they do seem to be able to change which genes they have turned on in the coral, uh, making them increase their expression of various factors that increase the resilience of the coral. And they do caution that this is just one species of coral, and we don't know what will happen with other corals yet. Um, And there are other problems, such as if the ocean also becomes much more acid, which we think it will with with, uh, increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, and pollution being present, that may also stress the system more but it's certainly encouraging and suggests that the corals may be able to keep pace with climate change and that the effects may not be as high impact as some people had feared our lines are open for you what do you want to ask chris what do you want to ask the naked scientist on 021 446 0567 011 883 we are taking your sms's as well on 31702 and 31567 give us a call anything that you want to ask we're taking your questions richard in cape town hi hello hello um i just wanted to ask chris i read an article recently about a gentleman in America who had a bionic eye installed, um, and it's apparently working quite well. And I just wanted to ask Chris about that, how it was made. So it doesn't make sense to me. I'll listen on the radio. Thanks. Hi, Richard. Well, the answer is that this is actually becoming more commonplace. What scientists are doing is trying to replace the so-called photoreceptors, the rods and cones in the retina, which is the light-sensitive sheet at the back of the eye, with devices which will send messages down the optic nerve to the seeing parts of the brain and therefore bypass the need for having rods and cones in the eye because there are a number of diseases that lead to those rods and cones breaking down and this leads to blindness. And there are now small devices that scientists are working on which consist of an array of electrodes, very closely packed, and on the front surface of these bionic eyes is a light-sensitive material So when spots of light land on the implant, they trigger the electrode to send a pulse of electricity into the retina underneath. And that pulse of electricity stimulates the cells that contribute to the optic nerve and send a pulse of nerve activity down the optic nerve and then onto the brain. And individuals given these implants do uh, achieve the ability to start to see spots of light when they're stimulated in this way. It's a very early stage at the moment and they haven't mastered the effects of doing colour and all that kind of thing, so it's very, very primitive, but it does mean potentially people can go from being completely blind to actually having the ability to see some spots of light in a useful way, and it's certainly a field that's moving forward quite fast. All right, I see you, uh, Vet- Vedes, in Midrand. I see your call. I'm going to come to you in a moment, and Desiree in Gardens will take your calls right after this. Talk radio. Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. And we're taking your calls for The Naked Scientist. 14 minutes to 10 o'clock. 021-446-0567. 011 I've got a tweet from Bonga Goenke who says, I just want to say he's the best. I enjoyed his show at the Ren Easter Show last Sunday. Great science. And Chris, we're getting a lot of that on email and, uh, and Twitter as well. So thank you. 
All righty. Uh, and, and a question from Mags says, regarding the debate over circumcision, please ask Chris if the foreskin has a function, whether removing it is good? Question mark. Uh, Reedy, really my personal opinion on this, and different people have different opinions, but my personal opinion, having read the science papers, is that it's a very good idea to get circumcised. Um, I personally believe it's a lot more hygienic, and I also am of the opinion that the evidence is that this, this strongly reduces the risk of, a picking, of acquiring things like uh, HIV and other sexually tra- transmitted infections. So I think it's a good idea for a range of different reasons. Other people have their own opinions, but the science strongly suggests that actually it's a beneficial procedure and probably best done uh, at a very young age because the healing time is very, very small. Mm -hmm. Uh, It also has an onward benefit for female partners because the risk of human papillomavirus carriage uh, on a circumcised penis is significantly lower than in an uncircumcised penis. And this means the chances of transmitting HPV, human papillomavirus, which causes cervical cancer, to a female partner is significantly lower. And as a result, you see lower rates of cervical cancer in the female partners of circumcised men. So my, my opinion is that it's a good idea, uh, especially in the current situation where we have things like H- HIV, which are very, very common in the population and, and relatively easy to transmit via sexual route, and that this has maybe a 60 to 80% protection rate if you're circumcised. So I think it's a good idea. Let's go to Rosemary. Rosemary in Cape Town, you have an interesting question. Welcome. Hi. Mm. Um, Chris, I'd like to know, what do you think was the greatest scientific discovery in the last 20 years? Well, I think there's a range of different answers to this, but I would certainly say up there with the best of them is Mm -hmm. our ability to read genetic material very, very fast. And the reason I say that is that we've gone from a time when when I first was... uh, If you were to try to read some genetic sequence, you might read a few hundred genetic letters at a time to a stage where we're now able to read the genetic blueprint of a whole organism in under a day. And why this is important is we're beginning to understand diseases with these sorts of techniques far more closely because we can actually interrogate what is happening when a person catches a disease. We can read their genetic material and ask, how does it change their genes? Why is that person susceptible to that disease? Or if you go to a bug, you can say, why does this bug make some people ill and not others and the answer must be Mm. in the dna so we're now able to to study a whole raft of different disorders infections and cancers this way and this is leading to new discoveries in terms of how drugs work how to excuse me how to develop the next generation of drugs and so on so certainly up there with the best of them would be genetic sequencing Um, that would be my number one pick i think vedas in midrand i hope i've said your name correctly good morning yes good morning um yeah, my question to uh, Chris is, uh, what would uh, happen if, uh, or if it is known to uh, mankind, uh, the, the situation of a, of a planet losing its gravitational pull from a, a, a mother star? If Could that you has just, uh, ever just been the recorded. Yeah, I also didn't sure understand of here. Uh, Vedas, what are you asking? Has there ever been a case of a planet... Oh. Yeah. Yes, a planet, yes. That Losing has lost... It's gravitational, yes. A pull from the mother star, I mean, from the sun, or, you know, which is the mother in this case. Uh, uh, situ- the situation of a, of a, of a solar uh, system. Okay, I think it is... Has there ever been a planet that lost its, uh, its uh, gravitational... Interconnecting. Pool, the connection yeah. to, uh, to it's, its connection to 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 the to the star. You're talking about the sun in particular. Yes, and okay. what I, I think I understand what he's getting. Yeah. Um, okay, I get it. I get it. There Chris? are planets out there which are called rogue planets, and they're very hard to detect. But yes, there are planets which are wandering in a lonely way through space, and we associate most planets with being in orbit around a star. And we spot those planets because the light from the star falls on them and reflects and we can see them. But scientists in recent years have begun to be able to detect these planets which appear to be on their own traveling through space. And there's a number of ways how this could happen. One one of these ways is that, for instance, if two stars interact with each other, the gravitational tug of war between them can lead to certain bodies, including big planets, being ejected from that system 
and whizzing off across space. And they're quite hard to spot because they're often quite cold and that means they don't emit any heat energy or very little heat energy, so there's not much light coming from them for the scientists to see. But some of the more younger, uh, newly ejected big planets like that can be spotted and they have begun to find them. And we think that they'll just go travelling on through interstellar space until something else captures them, either another star or a black hole, for example. Okay, thank you very much, Avides. Is it Tembani in Orange Farm? Hi. Hi, Rudy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's something I have noticed. If you go to a restroom and then make some few drop up, drop drops, then there's a bit of a smelling usually, no? Then if you strike at uh, matches, uh, that thing it seems to be diminishing. Could um, uh, the scientists explain what? Okay, going so on there? so so striking a match and that smell uh, kind of uh, dissipates a foul smell somewhere. That's that's right. Okay, Chris. <laughs> well, the idea of that, you know, if you foul the air in someone's bathroom, you could, you know, light a tissue or something or, or light your lighter. The idea is that, that some of the chemicals that contribute to the nasty smell are volatile chemicals that are whiff- whiffing around in the air, but which also are combustible. And so if you wave your lighter around or a match around, then you might be able to break down some of those chemicals. I think it's more likely, though, that you'll be invoking the phenomenon of masking effectively you're making a, a bigger smell than the smell that you found disagreeable ah. <laughs> so you're more likely to notice the bigger smell which is less disagreeable because there's more of it than the more subtle more unpleasant smell that you were trying to hide <laughs> and i think it's probably more likely to be the mechanism okay thank you very much it's amazing what uh, interesting questions people come up with thank you very much timbani uh, is it Desri, De- desi in gardens desri yes. hi good morning hi um chris I have a question for you. I'm a singing teacher, and I have um, for a long time thought it would be wonderful to find some kind of a device. You were speaking about hearing last week that could help to, with, with frequencies, with sound waves, to help um, pupils who can't pitch or, or people who cannot sing in tune. Is there such a device, and is, is it a feasible thing? Could it be to help because, I mean, you can bang away at the piano for hours, but they'll never get the tuning right. Is there something that would work with the inner ear? I think it would be fairly radical, Desiree, to, mm-hmm. to have a device that you could implant to help people sing better. No, not to implant, just... but just something that you could put on, perhaps, that inter- intercepts it or, or no? I see what you mean. Um, most people do this, as you know, by... Uh, singing a note and then they play the note on the piano and see how close they are or how off they are. Yes, but you can't and they try to, to learn. Uh, I agree. And I'm, I'm not sure that there's any such device which in people who lack that ability, because what you're trying to do is to picture in your mind, in the same way as if I imagine, ask you to imagine the colour red, then you could see a sort of red spot in your head. Um, you're, you're asking your pupils to imagine a note and then produce that note with their voice. And so you've got to take an imagined concept and then make a motor movement. You've got to have the right muscles and the right tone in your vocal folds in order to produce that sound. And there's therefore two ways in which it can go wrong. One, they can imagine the note wrong and then effectively set their muscles up wrong. Or they can imagine the note right and still set their muscles up wrong. And the people who get it right have a very good ability to picture that note in their head, imagine what they want it to sound like, and then make their vocal cords set up just right so the right note comes out and some people just seem to be able to do this incredibly well without really thinking about it others find it really really difficult and you know there, there are some of us who can sing a bit but as soon as you put us in a choir with someone with a very loud voice next to you singing a different of music <laughs> yeah. trying to find the right note that you're supposed to be singing for your line of music is really hard and i really struggle with that whereas other people are really very good at it and they, they just they picture in their head what it's going to sound like and they just go straight in there and sound great regardless of what everyone else around them is doing, which is probably a good thing in my case. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, thanks, Desiree. Let's go to our last caller. Is it Chris in Krugersdorp? Yes. Um, I just want to know, if, is it true that when I pour petrol in the morning, I get more out of it than if I had to pour in the afternoon? Pouring, okay. Okay, I think what you're possibly getting at is the thermal expansion, because when things get hot, they take up a bit more space. And so I suppose you're right that if you were to pump your petrol in the morning when it was very, very cold, 
then there'll be a, a smaller um, volume to the petrol, take up less space, and so more would appear to go through the pump than if you were to pump it when it was a bit hotter and therefore had thermally expanded a bit. Um, so there will be a subtle difference. Yes, yeah, an interesting question. Uh, it, were you were you to try to save the South African economy with this strategy? I think <laughs> you'd probably be onto a loser because the difference is going to be absolutely tiny at a, at a practical level. But you're absolutely right. The thermal expansion means that in the morning the pump will think it's pumped a little bit less fuel than it than it effectively will in the afternoon because it'll expand and take up a bit more space in your tank when it's hotter. Ah, very nice. Chris in Krugersdorp, thanks for the call. And uh, Chris, thank you very much for chatting to us. My mind is racing. I'm still thinking about your luggage that hasn't arrived. We'll see what <laughs> we can do about that. I've been sending thank tweets you. to uh, uh, some of the people who are on Twitter, and hopefully you'll get all your luggage very, very soon. Thank you very much. Fingers crossed. Thanks, Reedy. Really. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for everyone who came to see us at the RAND show uh, last week. We had such a good time. And also the, the 702 show on Thursday last week. It was really nice to see everybody. Fantastic. See you again next week. So that's that. We'll podcast our conversation with the naked scientist. And yeah, losing your luggage. It's the worst, worst, worst thing uh, at that time. And it's happened to me twice. The one was from a trip from Joburg to Cape Town, which wasn't a catastrophe because I was, you know, still in the country and I had, I could go buy stuff. And, but when you're overseas, when you're in a different country uh, and, and you have to buy stuff because you've got absolutely nothing, I can imagine how frustrating that is.